we can write our interference term a little bit different by saying it is epsilon naught C E naught one uh, E naught two, the two amplitudes times the cosine. And then let's go ahead and call it K1 minus K2 dot R. Get the spatial part together. And then plus uh, the difference in the phase is epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. That gets sort of what's the difference in the wave vectors in the space together? What's the difference in these phase constants together? And together, we'll call that delta is the phase difference between the two waves, between the two plane waves that are interfering. So all together then, we can say that the interference of two EM waves was the conditions that we set at the beginning, same frequency, different directions, is that the irradiance that you observe, I sum, the irradiance, not the field, the irradiance, is the irradiance of the first one plus the irradiance of the second one plus epsilon naught C times the dot product of their amplitude vectors E naught one plus E naught two times the cosine of a phase factor delta where delta equals k1 minus k2 dot r plus phase 1 minus phase 2. Okay? So now what we want to do is visualize what's happening with this. What's, what is all the geometrical parts going on in the phase factor? Because all the physical situations we come up with for the rest of this learning sequence are basically different ways to make this change and be interesting, okay? So to get started, we're not gonna think about a physical situation at all. We're just gonna visualize two plane waves overlapping, okay? So I'm going to show you an animation of two plane waves. Here's what they look like. They're kind of like this, but they have a color scheme, okay? Where we have red on top and blue on bottom. Okay, and they're kind of uh, transparent. So when two waves are in phase and they overlap, you get bright red and you get bright blue because the colors add. And when two waves are out of phase, you get purple. You just get a band of dim purple. Okay, it's a little hard to see, so we're gonna <laughs> turn some lights out here. And also let me raise the board up a little bit here. All right. So here's the waves, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. They're gonna come together at some angle, just like we calculated. And as they come together, you'll start to see bands of bright blue, bright red, and bands of slightly less dim, more of a purplish color. So maybe you can see those bands, okay? So those are the interference effect that we expect. When the two waves overlap constructively, we should get a stronger signal, the bright red and the blue. When the two waves overlap destructively, we should get nothing, which here is kind of a washed out uh, dim purple in this illustration. But what we can learn about by doing all this work is the way this behaves with changes in all these values. So one thing we can notice is that this uh, pattern is set up due to this cosine term, right? So let's think, what is that cosine delta? What, what values can that possibly take? Well, it could take all the way from plus one to minus one, okay? And if we think about what is its magnitude, if we were to square it, if I1 were to be equal to I2, then E1 would be equal to E2, and this would be uh, two times I, and this would be actually two times I as well because it's missing its half. So the point is, this can as much as double the total irradiance or it can drive it all the way to zero. You can get a negative, negative one here and they're missing the half so the whole thing can cancel. So the interference can drive it all the way to twice the amplitude you should get or no amplitude. So that's what the interference does. But notice that it doesn't depend on time. Right? There's nothing in here that depends on time. So if you sit at one place as these two ways pass each other, 
And if it's a maximum, it should always be a maximum. And if it's a minimum, it should always be a minimum. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to let them go over each other again. And I'm going to pick a special place on one of the bands where it's a maximum. And there it is right there. And even though it's a complicated roving pattern, you can see as long as I hold my pointer there, that's always where there's a maximum over a maximum. Okay. And the reason is there's no time dependence anywhere in here. We can uh, look at some other things. One is that it should depend on R, right? It does depend on space, depends on where you are. Well, yeah, sure enough, you can have a maximum uh, if you're here, constructive interference if you're here. If you change R, you can be in destructive interference. Constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive as you move around. So yes, it is accurate that it depends on R. What if we were to change uh, these, the phase factors, the phases? Well, those are really just sort of the offsets. Those sort of tell you where the origin is. And it says it does depend on those. So now I'm going to let one of these shift as though it's changed its phase or as though its origin moved. So there you go. And as that happens, sure enough, the whole pattern shifted. The pattern does depend on changing the phase of one of those two. Here it is again. Change the phase of this one. And the whole pattern changes. All right. And let's see. Finally, we could change. The only thing left is K. So I'm not going to change the magnitude of K, but I'll change the direction. So if we let the K direction change, you can see here it is wiggling a little bit, and the pattern changes. Right? The, the positions of these bright bands and dark bands wiggle a little bit as you change the directions of K1 and K2. So I just want you to have a good intuition for what's going on here. We're creating an interference pattern. And it's really not just an interference pattern projected onto a screen or a single line. It's really a fully three-dimensional series of bands of constructive and destructive interference. And according to the math, it has to depend on these things, K, R, and phase, and not time.